Today on the Texas Health Out Loud podcast, we discuss a healthcare epidemic that is sweeping the nation and shining a light on addiction. We're talking about opioids. Dr. Gary Malone is a psychiatrist in Texas Health Resources Behavioral Health Division. We'll talk to him about how your body can become dependent on them to the point that it causes you pain to go without them. The Texas Health Out Loud podcast starts now. From Texas Health Resources in Arlington, Texas, this is Texas Health Out Loud, a medical podcast featuring industry professionals, hospital leaders, and experts discussing healthcare topics that affect you and our community. Texas Health Out Loud starts now. Hello and welcome to the Texas Health Out Loud podcast. I'm Susie Solis. Thanks for joining us today. Last year, a public health emergency was issued across the country. The emergency was in response to the staggering opioid epidemic, the deadliest drug crisis in American history. Overdoses fueled by opioids are the leading cause of death for Americans under 50 years old. What is it about opioids that make them so addictive and so dangerous if abused? Here to talk about the widespread issue is Dr. Gary Malone, a psychiatrist in the Texas Health Resources Behavioral Health Division, who has seen the rise in opioid cases through the last decade. Dr. Malone, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So generally speaking, how is someone introduced to opioids? Is it through a prescribing doctor or can a person be introduced to an opiate socially like recreational drugs? Well, in this day and time, it comes from a lot of sources. Um, a lot of the kids get it, believe it or not, from their, their parents' medicine cabinet because these are prescribed so quickly and freely that they can get, they can pick it up there. People who use street heroin, uh, that number has not changed much. The The intensity has, has gotten more. The, the other factor that's changed here is the, um, the designer drugs coming from overseas, mainly from China, are incredibly powerful. So they're everywhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, you pick them up on the street corner. Uh, I have a young man uh, who got this kratom. He ordered it on the dark web. In fact, uh, it's, it's an opiate-based compound. Uh, you can order anything on the dark web. You can uh, Any of us can get on a computer right now, get a package from China next week containing um, high-dose fentanyl or carfentanil. It's much more prevalent now. And plus that combined with the um, uh, readily available uh, prescriptions you can get from the different pharmacies that they're actually – calling out now in some of these uh, Ohio and West Virginia, some of these parts of the country where this is so common. What are some of the actual drug names that people might recognize? The the compounds that you're going to hear, if you go to your doctor and say you have pain, they're going to give you hydrocodone or oxycodone. Um, and then it goes up the line there from fentanyl up to, uh, I've worked in cancer patients, you can take a, a teak of uh, lollipops. Things are incredibly powerful. The stuff you get from overseas, you'll get uh, Chinese fentanyl. You'll get the car fentanyl. Car fentanyl is 10 times more powerful than fentanyl used to tranquilize elephants. Wow. Uh, those are the ones that the, the, the agents, TSA agents, cannot touch. That kills the dogs when they smell it. Uh, and by the way, what the other thing has happened is that the, um, uh, the cartels from uh, Colombia and Mexico have always been selling heroin here. During the 80s, um, they lost their market when they introduced the black tar because it killed people. Now, in- introducing something that kills people now does not kill your market. So they reintroduced black tar heroin, and that they're all competing for the same basic base of people. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure you've seen lots of patients that are addicted to these drugs. Are there different kinds of opiates that cause this kind of addiction? Is there a certain kind of opiate that you see more of in working with people who are addicted? Well, and, and really, it, it, you can get addicted to any type of opiate. Even uh, some of the th- common painkillers like tramadol is a mu agonist. It's an opiate. Uh, it's a matter of it's dose-related. Um, but the new ones coming out are so powerful. Uh, I always tell people, say, if we're sitting in this room and they lock the doors and we have a bowl of fentanyl sitting in the middle of the room, in three days, we'll all be addicted. It's uh, so powerful. You cannot stay away from it. Uh, and the addiction rate on this, it's usually... Six to eight percent for all substances across the board. If you introduce uh, this type of opiate into a community, it's as high as twenty percent. And the way that uh, if you go to the, the crossroads up in, in Ohio, roughly twenty percent of the population who uh, are exposed are addicted. This is the exact same number when they introduced opiates um, in the eighteen hundreds into China. Mm-hmm. 
that was a number, 20%. It's a high number is because these substances are so powerful. Anyone who takes these will hit their septal nucleus, feel excitement, and then bliss. And if that has meaning to you, or you're trying to avoid things, or you have the genetics for addiction, you're gone. And every dose works less. So, so you're always trying to chase that high, that first high that you felt. Always. Until you get respiratory depression, drop dead. Wow. That's the, um, uh, the end point in this. And it's, it's usually, the average age of death is 46, but it can be a pretty early death um, if you're following that train. So that, what you described, is exactly the reason why these opioids are so addictive. Yes. If you are fortunate enough, some people take an opiate and they feel dysphoric or even kind of nauseated, and it's a blessing. A high percentage of people will feel wonderful, and that's just the, the issue with it. Uh, I worked in methadone clinics for a long time. I, I was the first person in Tarrant County licensed against Suboxone. Even those substances um, have such an incredible downside. And that's, again, why all our programs are drug-free programs, because uh, when I was in a methadone clinic, um, their chance of being drug-free at five years of 3%, and most people left our clinic by overdosing and dying. Wow. Average age of death in that clinic was 35. I just learned a big lesson there. Opiates uh, do have a use in, in uh, terminal cancer patients, and you prescribe those freely to those people. Do you see that sometimes someone doesn't even know that they're becoming addicted? It happens to me all the time. Uh, a common patient to come in for opiates for me will be a working person who has a job, has a family. They may have a family history of addiction, and they say, Dr. Lone, I don't drink. I saw what's happened to people I, in my family. I don't use substances. Their licensed physician writes some prescription. It works for a while, and then it doesn't work. And then they keep taking more and keep taking more, and they're referred to a pain management doctor who gives them more and more. And then they suddenly become a problem patient because they're using the medicine too quick, and they send them to me. They go, why am I seeing you? You're a psychiatrist. You're an addiction person. They feel like they're on the other side of the mountain and have to explain to them how the progression occurred, and they go, oh, I see what happened to me, that they had a genetic risk and a vulnerability and didn't know it. And they trusted people, which they should up to a point, who gave them a substance that got them in trouble. Yeah. So... I guess what you're describing, you know, how would someone know if they were addicted to their pain medication if they're having to continually raise the dose? Well, and, and these are some general principles on this. These medicines were designed to be taken for more, no more than two weeks. If you take an opiate longer than two weeks, you're in trouble. You're self-medicating withdrawal. Wow. And uh, they always come out with a new one that's non-addictive, and a, a quick story on that. Um, in the late 1800s, when all the opiates were introduced into China, they spread to Europe, and so they decided to get a cure. So they went to the Bayer Company, makes aspirin. Good mm -hmm. German scientists are very good. So we need a, a non-addictive form of um, opium. And so they created a new substance. We've purified the opium, and uh, this is going to be, this is going to cure society. It's going to be the hero of society. We're going to have a female name called heroin. How'd that work out? Wow. You know about stock in that company, huh? Um, I'm sorry, I'm a little cynical. This happened in my in my career multiple times. They come out with a new opiate that's not addictive. They're all addictive. You have to face up to dealing with your pain in a safe way. That's very difficult in our society. I'm going to work hard, you know, put me in coach, shoot me up with a steroid or something. I'm going to go out and play cornerback. Well, you know, maybe you better take care of your knee. You know, and I say that as an analogy. Um, the other part is somebody said, I got to go to work. I'm fighting with my wife. I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm having trouble with my parents. I had something bad happen to me as a kid. I don't want to stop and deal with it. I want to take something to make it go away. Mm -hmm. And that's the slippery slope. And something that I hear often too is like, you know, somebody's in a car accident through no fault of their own, and then they have, you know, lower back pain, or maybe they have some issue with, you know, a knee or whatever. And that's what happens. They end up getting addicted to these pain pills that were supposed to make them feel better after their car accident. And that's the exact scenario. And people went in my office and they're so, they're, they're bewildered and they're angry. Uh, and so we have to start with, how are you sitting in this chair in front of me? And we go through the exact scenario we're talking about. And we have to talk about the fix. Mm -hmm. The fix is to be detoxified very often in the hospital, get on safe medicines, and do a non-narcotic pain management program, which works about two-thirds of the time. It's a highly successful program. It takes work. You have to focus on it. It doesn't just happen. 
Yeah. So is that the only treatment option or are there more? Well, what we do is pretty broad. Um, everything I read about that they come out to say is new is part of what we're already doing. Uh, there's some programs come out in California that use acupuncture and do uh, yoga. We've been doing that for 30 years. That uh, basically a non-narcotic pain management, you detoxify from the opiates, you get on a safe grouping of medicines that actually works about 40% of the time. We then uh, start people on lifestyle changes. We use biofeedback and hypnosis. It works surprisingly well. We train people to respond to their bodies, to uh, assess, do pain scales, measure them uh, three or four times a day, um, uh, to uh, incorporate uh, yoga stretching, exercise, meditation into their lives. And the quote I give people um, that uh, you're supposed to meditate uh, 30 minutes a day unless you're really busy and really stressed, then you meditate for an hour. And go, oh, no, I'm too busy to do that. No, you're not. Mm-hmm. That uh, And we, I even talk about how we set it up. You know, you work out for an hour, and then you meditate for 30 minutes afterwards. And that go, oh, I can't do that. I'm too busy. Well, everything else is more efficient if you do that. We have to get a pain level below a three, or else you're too distracted and get depressed. And that takes work. That program takes work to get someone without narcotics or opiates to get there. But what I always tell people is that your pain uh, is experienced in your midbrain. You take an opiate, that goes away temporarily. But then you have to keep chasing that dose. Once you stop, that pain shoots up. It's like if you burn your finger and you put a piece of ice on it. You take the ice off, the pain shoots up. It then drops off. It resets naturally in your brain. Your finger does not hurt. You're hurting in your midbrain. We train you how to deal with that in a different way and how to take care of your body, your vessel, so you have the option to live a long time. If someone is, say, a recovering alcoholic, they generally stay clear of alcohol. But if you become addicted to opioids and are recovering from that addiction, does that mean you should steer clear of opiates basically for the rest of your life? Well, if you have the genetics uh, that um, you should do not take any addictive substance on a regular basis. That's uh, alcohol, obviously, an opiate, a benzodiazepine, or a stimulant. So what if you break your leg? What if you get an abscess tooth? You take uh, a dose for three days. By five days, you're off of it. And practice your um, relaxation, meditation techniques before this happens. You do it every day so that when you do have an abscess tooth, you're not going, what did that doctor say? You know, I forgot. How did I do that? You practice it every day so you have some protection when this occurs. And um, pain is bad for everybody. Uh, if you break your leg, you take an opiate for three or four days. And we have this discussion with people all the time. Don't just tough it out because it's actually worse for you. But you get off as quickly as you can uh, or else it grabs you. It's like flypaper. You touch it, you can't let go. And this affects all ages. Yes. The, the most common substances in adolescents are still marijuana and alcohol. But opiates are so common, they're there they're, they're now. They're, they're getting addicted. Uh, this really, uh, in every age group, this affects everyone. The people most likely to be prescribed this are older people. I see a lot of people who are um, over 50 who are, who are just freely prescribed opiates, and they're the most vulnerable, and they're the people who need to exercise the most. The, the studies show people over 50 who exercise more, their hearts are healthier, they have less dementia, they have less pain. They're giving you exactly the wrong treatment. Thank you so much. That's going to do it for today's Texas Health Out Loud podcast. Very interesting topic today. And I'd really like to thank Dr. Malone for joining us. We really appreciate it. At Texas Health, we're partnering with you for a better North Texas. To hear more Texas Health Out Loud podcasts, you can visit our website at texashealth.org slash out loud. And you can also subscribe to our podcasts on iTunes and Google Play. I'm Susie Solis. Thanks for joining us for Texas Health Out Loud. Out Loud.